Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. However you're watching, wherever you're watching, however you're listening, wherever you're listening, it's the Bet Online Salute Detroit podcast. And I guess I should leave it to if you're now watching, if you're still listening for the remainder of this season. It's the Bet Online Salute Detroit podcast. We got the tripod here, betonline.ag, where the game starts. Go to betonline.ag, get all the up to latest odds, stats, wagers, anything you need to do to get your sports betting. Also brought to you by underdog fantasy go to underdogfantasy.com or go to the underdog fantasy app put in promo code usc lafb you get a hundred dollar match you get to pick up to two to eight did you know it's eight now ryan i was on the website today it's eight yeah. like, never knows two to eight people over under are they going to hit and you can score you some cash put in promo code usc lafb up to a hundred dollar match gentlemen welcome Welcome, welcome to Tripod is here. Like we said, I haven't been around. Uh, let's talk to Ryan. Ryan, how are you doing? Long time no see. We miss you, Ryan. I know. We yeah. always miss Ryan. Come on, man. Yeah, but yeah. he's busy working. We just talk. Ryan's the one who's actually doing the working behind the scenes. So Yeah, he's the, he's the hamster in the wheel. Keeping he's the, the engine, on. baby. He's the straw that stirs the drink. Just going, just going. But good. All good. Uh, excited that it's not so hot. I'm loving this cool, hazy weather. It's been great. So, uh, yeah, how you doing? I'm doing well. Mad man, how are you doing? How's parenthood? Doing well. Hey, Parenthood, it's a great my uh the baby slept for five and a half hours last night, which was a huge oh, breakthrough nice. for us. That's the most sleep we've gotten in three weeks. So very excited there. You know, gave me so much energy, coach, that I had the opportunity to go to the the USC next level sports conference uh, you know, the today, which was really fun. A lot of uh interesting topics and kind of a heavyweight audience there. Adam Silver, Maverick Carter, President Folt was there, Juju Watkins. Um, you know, owner of the Atlanta Hawks, a uh, lot of con- really interesting conversation about the future of, of sports from a tech media perspective, but also the future of college athletics, which I'm sure we'll get more into in the weeks and months to come as we get into the offseason. You even got enough energy for you to go and shave, too. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. It was <laughs> it was getting a little out of control uh, yesterday, so I uh, had to had to do a little shaving. That's good. That's good. I celebrated a birthday today. The goose is two today. Oh, Bo Rose two today. Oh, congratulations! Yep. That's amazing. Yep, he. Was, it's so crazy that they don't even know at the age like it's their birthday. Totally. So, but he all he knows is that he got a whole little mini cake to himself. Oh, so is it is it, it like the smash cake where they, they can just smash it? No, nah, I just wanted to get him the cake, so I just went to Stater Brothers and spent like eleven bucks on like a little circle cake and nice, you know, just something intimate. And then we're having a party for him on a uh, Saturday. There you go. There you I'll, go. I'll shoot you the address. I thought I sent it to you, but I'll shoot you the invite. Come through if you have the opportunity. Well, ladies and uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is what is known as an invitation right here. You know, it's <laughs> like, hey, I thought I sent you the address, but I really you know, it must did. have been my bad. You know, I no, I Coach happened back to... in the day. Must have broken up where it's like, look, it's not you, it's me. You yeah. know, so uh, <laughs> Coach has given us the "it's not you, it's me" routine on event invitations now. So it was so bad that I had to go check to make sure I invited my aunts, and I had to go look at theirs. It was like. Oh, I did invite them. And then I looked at yours. I was like, damn, I, th- I, th- I thought I invited Madman. So coach is, uh, you know, coach has been too busy sort of contemplating the edge, you know, the edge of the balcony over the course of the last few days. No, I'm off the edge. Games, it seems. I'm off. I, I'm jumping. <laughs> I jumped. I, I, I am all for, I am all for let's fundraise the money and let's get the firm going and let's, let's make a move. You, I'm, I, my mind has not changed, but that's neither here nor there. We got the Terps coming in, and it's not a basketball game. Believe it or not, Juan Dixon and the Terps aren't coming in to play in the judges at the Galen Center. Um, no, we're going to the Terps. They're not even coming in. We're going to the Terps. Um, first thing, uh, Maryland's head coach, Mike Loxley. I have a bunch of respect for Mike Loxley. And if you go and look at Mike Loxley, one of the reasons why I have a lot of respect for Mike Loxley is because he puts a lot into mental health for student athletes. And a lot of articles also will come out like he's very fair with NIL because it's, I mean, it's Maryland football. They're known as a basketball school and they don't have a lot. And he's very fair. He tries to make it work. But other than that, he was also in football rehab, but a lot of people don't know. He's a statement understudy. I don't know if a lot of people know it or not, but he's a statement under understudy. Um, I had a privilege to meet him. When I was coaching in New Mexico, he came through and he was at New Mexico at one time. But Mike Loxley is a very, very respected coach. And and for me, 
um, coming up through the coaching world and all one of the guys I follow, he's kind of like Justin Wilcox for me last year. You guys heard me talk about Jackson Wilcox and he's like a Jeff fish guy, highly underrated. And I think a very good coach. I think he's going to have this team prepared, ready to come through. Um, I mean, this is a coin flip game. I think we're what a seven point favorite, but I mean, who's going to be the star, right? This might be uh Edwards day. We, we sure do make stars out of guys who are very average. So, uh, this might be another thing that's happening. Uh, I'll kick it. I'll kick it off to Ryan. Ryan, what do you think about this week? Uh, us going to College Park, Maryland to play the Turtles. Yeah, farthest uh, USC will travel all year, going to College Park, just south of Baltimore, where my niece lives. So nice and close there. Uh, One o'clock kick here in uh, LA, but yeah, it should be an interesting game. You mentioned Billy Edwards Jr. Uh, pretty. Pretty good quarterback. I mean, this team, we were talking, even Jamal, before you got on, we were talking before offline. Like, I don't really know what to expect from this Maryland team because they've looked good in some instances and then got blown out last week by Northwestern. So it's kind of like, what do you expect? And obviously, USC can't go into this game sleeping. They can't go into any game the rest of the season sleeping. Um, got to win an all. And, and this is certainly not going to be an, on paper, it might be an easy one, but it, it's still a conference matchup and it's a road game. And this team hasn't proven to play well on the road. So um, should be a fun game. I'm curious to see what the Maryland crowd is like, as you mentioned, it's not like a huge football school, a little smaller stadium. They're three and three, <laughs> Oh, and three in the big 10. Um, but I feel like anytime SC comes to town, it's going to, it's going to bring people out. Cause no matter what your record is, you want to beat SC. So um, it'll be fun. And SC has got to be ready for this one. They got to, they got to play well and, and play all four quarters and come out of the gates and, and not make any mistakes. As we talked about last week, they can't have any self-inflicted wounds and, and really need to come out of this game, not just winning, but you know, proving that they are a good football team and not actually a three and three football team. So we'll see. Matt, man, you're on the mic. Yeah, no, I think uh, Ryan said it well. You know, a couple things I'm looking for, and and first, I think Ryan alluded to it really nicely, is uh, Billy Edwards Jr. is kind of a, a low-key, prolific quarterback here. You know, part of this might be a little bit of the schedule. Part of this might be just Maryland, you know, being a non-football school, flying a little bit under the radar. But Ryan mentioned this is a 3-3 three and three football team that played six games. Billy Edwards missed one game, uh, but he's been the starter for five, will presumably be the starter here on Saturday, no question about it. He's thrown for over 250 yards in every game. So when you when you look at the, the context of the Big Ten, and I know we've talked a lot about context here in the last few weeks, that's those are significant numbers in a, in a conference that is slower paced, fewer plays, more a methodical style. I, they, they did a really nice job against a really good Indiana team a couple of weeks ago, kind of stayed in that game for a while before ultimately losing 42-28. And then just the doors got blown off last week at home against Northwestern. So you're wondering which of these teams shows up. Is it the team that played Indiana competitively for about two and a half quarters? Or is it the team that was a no-show against Northwestern at home? So I think so much of that will ride on kind of Billy Edwards and his ability, I think, to get some confidence, some rhythm early in this game, get some completions. So keep an eye on Billy Edwards Jr. Number two coach, they have a clear number one wide receiver in Ty Felton. You know, he's through six games, uh, 55 catches, 719 yards, five touchdowns. So he's coming in averaging 120 receiving yards per game. Now, this is yet another ball game where it's very clear who their leading receiver is. He has basically doubled the number of receiving yards as the next leading receiver on the Terrapins. So we talked so much about Tyler Warren last week, and Tyler Warren blew up. Um, This is a game where Ty Felton is clearly their number one weapon. So does USC understand that well enough to take him potentially out of the game and make someone else beat them? Or is this going to be another case where you it's the known devil, you know what's coming, and you can't stop it? So really keep an eye on uh, that Ty Felton matchup And then third is, it's just, I think, the overall emotional disposition of this team. Where is USC's psyche uh, the last couple of days after such a heartbreaking loss, having to travel a long distance? Coach, I know you're not going to be pleased about this, but they're leaving even later than normal. I know you've talked about, you know, needing to go on Thursday rather than Friday. Lincoln Riley earlier in the week said, we're going to go even later than we normally do because we just kind of want to be there for the game and pop right back. So what what does that kind of look like in terms of energy levels come 1 p.m. Pacific and kickoff? Um, and then just beyond that, how does this team emotionally recover, not just from that loss, but also the news of, A, 
Eric Gentry, you know, officially kind of redshirting for the rest of the year. So arguably your best defensive player now is no longer with you for the remainder of 2024. And then, of course, the Anthony Lucas news from earlier in the week that he's going to be out for the rest of the season. So you're talking about arguably your two most talented defensive players not going to be in uniform. You're emotionally a little wobbly. And now you got kind of a quarterback receiver combination where you got to go across country. So Maryland is certainly not uh, a, a, an opponent that you would put on the top of your list in terms of level of difficulty for USC. But considering the circumstances, I think it's going to be a tough game. And I think that's why the odds makers have USC as only a seven point favorite coach considering they lost by 27 at home to Northwestern just the week before. So I think they're kind of taking some of those things into consideration. So lots to kind of keep an eye on. I expect USC to win this game comfortably, but, you know, things could get complicated. Yeah, very high expectations. I expect to see the same stuff we've been seeing throughout the whole year. It's going to be a close game. We're going to let guys do what they do. The question is, are we able to make a stop in order for us to walk out with the win? Like I, I, we we lost two of the, our best defenders. I mean, our defense isn't very stout. Billy Edwards has a hundred forty five point eight two passing rating, and he's sixty eight percent passing. You know what I mean? <clears throat> my only question is, I mean, I I feel like we have the ability to win, but my question is, what are we going to get out of Maryland? Right? Is Maryland just going to play their game and let Billy Edwards do his thing, or are they like, well? We're going to go to the whale, too, and then all of a sudden we're going to get Robin Hemby, and he's going to have the best game of his life this Saturday, right? Like, those are the questions we're going to – we have to ask, and we're going to see, like, if I'm Mike Loxley, I'm going to try to go to the whale. I'm going to be like, let's see if we can actually run on these guys because everybody else has had so much success running on these guys. Like, they give up at least 150 yards a game. Let's try it. You know what I mean? If that doesn't work, I'm going to throw the ball. (laughs) because <laughs> like, I have a quarterback that's good enough to throw the ball and I got a receiver that's a playmaker. So I'm going to go get it. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a comfortable game. I am interested though. I'm not too upset with them leaving later because I'm kind of interested with that mentality because it kind of happens with the pros, especially basketball, leave, go work, and then get out the next day. I am kind of interested. I just want to see what the time slots are. Are they going to get there like at six, get meetings, get some food, go to bed, go play, and then hop back on a plane? I am interested to see how that works. That might work, but I'm curious to see. I like to do a study on that one. I'm not overly upset about it. I'm more interested and intrigued to see how that works because that happens with, you know, NBA, MLB, football. Did you, did you see, Coach, what, uh, what Kurt Sargetti said, the Indiana coach, just like, yesterday on a on a show i'm aware look me up huh well yeah besides that <laughs> oh, he said no, just he that said. he's like i leave as late as possible he's really like, we leave as late as possible we get in we go to bed we wake up play and get back on the plane so yeah, yeah. like that's what i'm you saying you never know what really i mean it's different for every program obviously but that's what that was his philosophy and i and I, i'm not against that because pros do it if pros didn't do it and they weren't so like you know what i mean there's dominant teams who do it so i'm not i'm not totally against it but when you look at the time slots, the way SC was doing it, I know we're getting back on this. I sound like a broke record, but like when they went to Michigan, they left like six thirty here, which was nine o'clock that time, and it's like a four hour flight, and they get there at one o'clock, and then it's probably a walkthrough, and then you get a walkthrough, and then you go back to the hotel, and then all of a sudden you're in meetings. Like there's never any time just to be like, all right, go get a quick nap or just get off your feet, or just relax. I think you're always going, 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 going. Next thing you know, you're up for a game, you're playing a game, and you're like, whoa, what happened? It's like a it's like a wedding. Wedding, you're going, going, going. Next thing you know, you wake up like, damn, that wedding went by pretty fast. <laughs> it's like those things. So I, I am interested about leaving later. I'm actually not opposed to it, Matt, man. I, I kind of want to see it because yeah. pros do it. So I'm not against it. I just... I'm just not convinced, and I don't think you guys can convince me at all this season that we're going to see anything where SC walks in and handles any team favorably like they're supposed to do. It's We haven't played clean all year. We haven't played clean in three years. I don't think they're going to play clean, but I do think they have the opportunity to win. It's just can they get the stops, and is Mike Loxley going to go to the well? What do you got on that, Matt, man? Well, Coach, I mean, you bring up an interesting point. And, you know, so much of the conversation, I'll, I'll go a little bit just big picture as, as, as you just did, is, you know, are, are we getting better from last year, right? And so much of that narrative has been, look, you know, on the one hand, this is a team sitting at 3-3, three and three, 13 points from being 6-0, and oh, possibly a top five team, three plays away from being 6-0. Oh. You know, we've heard the 
the Lincoln Riley spiel. I always believe that that's a very dangerous philosophy because you can play that both ways, right? You know, you can say, yeah, this team is three, three plays from being six and oh, this team is also two plays from being one and five, right? Like if Wisconsin doesn't fumble up 21 to 10 and Garrett Nussmeyer late in the fourth quarter of that game uh, against LSU with under two minutes makes the right read and hands it off to John Emery Jr. for a touchdown. LSU's up 24-20 with less than two minutes to go. And we've seen how this team has sort of responded down on that last possession. This is very easily two plays from being a one and five team. So I think we have to sort of zoom out and look at what are kind of the statistics, what's the evidence, what's sort of the analysis to really say whether the 2024 Trojans are better or worse than the 2023 Trojans. And right now, everyone's kind of leaning on points per game, yards per game, points allowed per game, yards allowed per game. And I think the problem with that, and, and we sort of lean on that as saying, okay, look, this team was 112th last year. They're top 40, 45 this year defensively and yards allowed, points allowed. Of course, there's a ton of improvement. And I think the problem with that analysis right now, coaches, we're not taking context into account. We're not taking the pace of play into account. To compare 2024 Big Ten versus 2023 Pac-12 or 2020 Big 12, you know, the, the conferences that Blinken Riley has come from, is just apples and oranges. You know, you're, the, last year in the Pac-12 was a much more wide open conference. F- teams were getting to the line of scrimmage quicker. There were more possessions in the game. And so to just take yards per game, points per game, yards allowed per game, points allowed per game, that's not really a function of performance. That's more of a function of tempo. Because I'll give you an example, Coach. If I have one game, and it's an extreme example, there's 10 possessions in a game, and I give up five touchdowns, and I get five stops, and I I gave up, on average, 50 yards per possession, but I got five stops. I've given up 500 yards in that game and 35 points versus a game where, let's say there was only four possessions in the game, and I gave up a touchdown every drive, and it was an 80-yard touchdown. At the end of the day, who was better defensively? Was it Team A or Team B? It was Team A because Team A got five stops. Team B got no stops. But the stats would say Team A gave up 35 points and 500 yards. Team B gave up 28 points and 320 yards. So Team B is better. That's the problem right now with sort of the holistic approach of saying just yards per game and points per game. To me, Coach, and I have an article on this on LAFootballNetwork.com. Encourage everyone to to go and, and read it and argue. But to me, the purest metric is yards per play gained and yards per play allowed. And if you take those two stats, because that's a pure pure function of performance, last year, Coach, SC, 7.1 yards per play in 2023 offensively, good for fifth in the country. This year, 6.2 yards per play offensively, good for 31st in the country. So we've seen a big drop-off in explosiveness, and I think we can see why. There's a drop-off in terms of just Raw athlete, raw improvisational skills, raw creativity from Caleb Williams to Miller Moss. Miller Moss has done a fantastic job, but he's not Caleb from an explosiveness perspective. We have yet to see a wide receiver one emerge the way we had with Taj Washington and Brendan Rice last year. We've seen a lot of inconsistency, kind of lack of goal routes, a lot of chunk plays. And then third, we have yet to see kind of the emergence of Zach Branch as that do-it-all weapon. And so for all three of those things, I think it's obvious that SC is less explosive than they were last year. But here's where it gets interesting, is the defensive yards you know, per play allowed. Last year, historically bad defense. We don't need to rehash it. Alex Grinch, public enemy numbers one, two, three, four, and 5 in, in USC lore. Worst defense in program history. They gave up 5.9 yards per play last year, Coach. 93rd in the nation. This year, with Danton Lynn, with this new scheme, With, you know, cleaning up in terms of tackles, with all the strength and conditioning, they're giving up 5.8 yards per play. It's 82nd in the country. So So it's only been, it's been a very incremental improvement defensively. And so when you look at the moderate drop-off from 7.1 yards per play to 6.2 yards per play offensively, you've seen a moderate drop-off offensively in terms of explosiveness, but only an incremental gain defensively. You put that net together, And statistically, this team is worse than last year. It's just the data speaks for itself. And so 
we have to take sort of the context into account of where we are right now. I think we've kind of gotten carried away a little bit early in the season with that LSU win, and we saw some tackling for the first time, and that impression is still in our minds, and we were left last year with such a bad taste in our mouth defensively. But if you take the whole body of work, statistically, this team is not as good as they were last year. Now, the good news is we're only at the halfway mark, and so now Lincoln and Danton and company have six games, which is a glorified preseason for 2025 to get the right habits, to get the right discipline, to get the right execution, to get the right scheme, to now be in a situation where you can see improvement in an absolute make it or break it 2025 year. So that is what I'm going to be looking for, Coach, in terms of this game against Maryland. Does that curve start trending up in terms of yards per play gained and yards per play allowed? Ryan, bring in some optimism for us. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think the only not even a counterpoint just to add to it is the last thing you said, the the halfway through the season. And when you look at SC through six games last year, who they played, it was San Jose state. It was Nevada. It was Colorado. It was Stanford. It was so, I mean, the competition was way different than what they've played this year. So, I mean, you got to take that into factor, but I mean, nothing is incorrect about that at all. And those are, I think are the, the absolute stats. And even Lincoln Riley said that at the beginning of the season, someone asked him about stats and he said, I don't look at, yards per game that means he brought that exact point up like it possessions make a difference like i look at yards per play as like the the one stat i kind of look at i don't care about how many yards we have in a game if we didn't score points in the red zone i look at points and and yards per play so um yeah i mean it's got to be an, an incremental improvement um i just the only again not a counter just the only thing i would say is usc six and oh last year played a a much softer opponent than they have in six games this year very different style um, a lot of differences. And, and so I'm not even defending the play this year. It's just those one other thing to think about, but you know, it's, it's a great point and something that uh, they got to see defense defensively and offensively both improve it, along down the stretch through the second half of the season. Ryan, Do you know, what's to- interesting. Uh, I'll just add coach and give it to you is Ryan, don't you see the mirror image here a little bit in terms of schedule from this year and last year where last year it was soft up front. And then remember, we said, you know, at the beginning of last year, we said, man, this is the softest first six I've ever seen. And then it goes really Brutal. extreme, right? Yeah. That, that second six. And we saw it, right, in terms of performance. We went for six and oh, and then the second six was one and five. And you, and you sort of saw that difference. Here, it feels like the inverse, right? To have Penn State, to have LSU, to have some of these more marquee games up front. Now you have sort of this stretch of five consecutive unranked opponents where it gets soft again. So can they kind of go on a run a little bit? But I think at the same time, I don't think we should sort of fall into the trap of the fool's gold of just winning these unranked games. It, it really has to come down to the how. What's the yards per play gain? What's the yards per play allowed? How are they winning these games? And what are they doing to win these games? Not just the bottom line of winning. You know, so yeah. I think it's going to be a really interesting stretch here over these next five, six weeks, kind of leading into that season finale against Notre Dame where... Look, at this stage, we're playing the role of spoiler. You know, if you can't do anything in your season, what better than to sort of knock out a rival, right, coach? And so it's, you know, we're, we're playing the role of spoiler uh, for Notre Dame at the end of the season. Can we sort of get these five games as body of work to have the good habits to be able to do so? Well, I've, it's, been it's, spoiled. I've been spoiled before. I know, I know. I didn't bring it up. I didn't bring it up, Coach, out of sensitivity, if you notice. I didn't mention it, okay? So. I've been spoiled before. 13, 13, 13 and 9. To nine. I wasn't going to say anything, Coach, okay? You know? hey, hey, 13 and 9, a tip ball to a wide open Steve Smith in the touchdown that would have sent us to the national championship. There it is. Eric it, McNeil. Uh, Eric yep. McNeil, you know. Go ahead, Ryan. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I was just last thing I was going to say it is it's – how narratives are created too, right? Like last year, six and zero, oh, you finish seven and five, and it's like, wow, it is terrible. This year, three and three, everything seems bad. You finish nine and three, and it's like, well, I think the things are in the right direction. Yeah. Like, no one, <laughs> once the season's over, no one actually looks at who the opponents were. They just look at like, well, how'd you finish and how'd you start and yada yada yada. So it's you know that's how sports narratives in general go. I disagree. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think we could say. This was a successful season. Well, I'm not I mean, saying us. I'm just saying. No, like, no, 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 no. I, I, I get you. Even perce- perception, even on the outside, I don't think we could say this is a successful season because 
Well, before the season, coach, you said like eight and four was a good season. I understand that. But if somebody told me I'm going eight and four, I'm trying my best to go undefeated. Well, you get what I'm saying? Like, like we, we we have to be realistic. And I admit it, too. I was powdering butts at the beginning of the season and I got blinded. I, the light got me. I'm pretty sure the light got some of us, too. And then all of a sudden it clicked. Jordan, it legit clicked in this before even halftime. I'm legit watching the game. I'm like, nothing's changed with this team. Not one thing has changed with this team. And like I'm I like we're going on year three and we're still seeing the same thing, right? Caleb was able to do it with Jordan Addison year one and Todd's Washington and, and Brendan Rice. Like they were loaded skill-wise and playmaker-wise. When the playmakers fell off, and it's just it was two playmakers. Now that Caleb Williams had to go to with even worse defense, you saw the results. And now we're looking at the same thing. It's like we have a new quarterback, new system. And I'm not saying anything is wrong with Miller Moss. I, I think Miller Moss is doing a spectacular job with what he's doing. But we get young receivers, and none of them wants to be the bell cow and break away. And then, like, when it comes down to it, like, two games in a row. Actually, three games when you really think about it. Michigan, we needed a stop. We needed one stop in the Michigan game, and we could not get it. We needed one stop in Minnesota. We could not get it. We needed two stops against Penn State, and we could not get it. This is the same thing all over again. Like, it's not like – like, well, we have to be realistic, right? And like Jamal said – and Jamal, like, you're – and correct me if I'm wrong. You said last year there was 7.1, and this year there was 6.9 or something like 6. that? 6.2. 6.2. So what's that? that's eight-tenths of a yard? Yeah. Right? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty significant amount, Coach, you know, uh, on a per-play basis offensively. You know, when you're going from 7.1 yards to 6.2 yards, you know, that, that it ch- kind of changes things a little bit. You yeah, know, it they're, does they're change things. Some... But so my question to that, my only question to that be if we're asking – do you think it went down because of the because of the time of the possession that SC has the ball now? It's not as explosive and it's more methodical. That that could be my only argument to that to that no, those numbers. And I don't know if that's true or not. But the thing that's shattering to me is they're giving up the same amount of yards on defense. If you're going to get less yards offensively, you need to stop them more. And they're not stopping anybody anymore. Like when you really look at it. Let's look at the quarterback from Penn State. He came in. He only had about 600 yards passing. He left the game and had 1,100 yards. Like, like we made this guy. We made this guy. He won't have another game like that all year. Like, uh, the quarterback from Minnesota. Like, he's not going to be – he wasn't a world beater, but there's articles all over Fox about him. Who is this guy? Who's Bosmer? We won't hear from Bosmer again. We're doing the same thing again. We just have on a different outfit. That's the only thing that scares me. So, like, I get we're 8-14, and 14, this and that. But – can we try to overachieve a little bit? Can we try to like we can't go through we can't go through as an SC football program or SC team or us sitting here as an SC podcast saying we're satisfied if SC goes eight and four. It's not acceptable. If that's if that's what we are, then somebody needs to just come out and tell us what we are, and we need to ship our our mind thought and we need to ship our direction. But I'm a winner, and I want to see this program win, right? I didn't go to the national championship because I lost two games. And those two games were heartbreakers. Those games that we should have won, right? And we were a way better team. Like, this team is, like, just not even considered. Like, there's so many things, and I'll pass it to you guys. There's so many things that they're putting in the media that's so disrespectful that should trigger these guys, and it just doesn't trigger them. NCAA said they're a tier two team. Never in my life would I thought USC would be a tier two team. They put so much stuff on Fox. They don't even consider SC and things that they should be considered in. And people just accept it. As a team, they just accept it. And it, it and it's it's just shattering to me. Like those are things that need to be fixed before you can even consider being a national championship contender. Like you just need to stop taking disrespect. And change those types of things, but but I mean, it is what it is. I'm I, I, like I said, I'm still where I am. Let's fundraise the money. Let's go with the buyout. Let's make the move. I'm I'm still standing on that. Like let's fundraise it now. The buyout will be a lot less if we do it by game six next year. So let's start fundraising the money now. Put it in the bank. Let some interest grow on it, and we might have a little bit left over for a buyout. You guys can go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just <laughs> that's just I'm sorry. The, the the one thing I'll say, Coach, I'll, I'll say something kind of at a at a tactical level and then kind of more at, at a strategic level to, to sort of your points. The first is kind of, I think, at a tactical level, I think what we're seeing from the 7.1 yards per play last year versus the 6.2 yards per play this year is we're just not taking enough downfield shots, right? Yeah, I, I mean, you're I getting 
you know, outside of the Jacoby Lane kind of touchdowns from 30 yards out, and he's had a few of them, and they've been phenomenal. Obviously, LSU, we had great one Michigan, great one Wisconsin. That was just such a dime. To me, still kind of the play of the year offensively was that Jacoby Lane touchdown against Wisconsin outside, of course, of the the Hudson, you know, two catches. You know, and then we had the Hudson two catches in that LSU game. But outside of that, there haven't been a lot of real downfield shots and opportunities. Miller's done a phenomenal job kind of reading this defense, dissecting this defense, but he's doing the, the, the dominance of his dissection is sort of level one and level two of the defense. He's not really going to level three. I think that's a function of his comfort level uh, with this offense. I think it's a function a little bit of his arm strength, but I think more than anything else, it's a function of protection. And, and you know, when you are when you are particularly not getting uh, protected on the edge, you got to think, right? I mean, when you're throwing the ball down the field, you got to really have confidence in that back foot being planted, right? And when you, you're going to plant that back foot and then you're going to sort of explode in terms of your throwing motion, if there's some hesitancy that you're going to get undercut or you're going to get hit, you know, it, it's hard to sort of work through that, you know, where, where you know you're going to get hit, not going to get as much on the ball, And so psychologically, you may already be kind of thinking about level one, level two of the defense. So I think it's the lack of the goal routes. It's the lack of the down the field shots for a variety of reasons that's leading to the explosiveness. Now, coach, kind of more from a strategic level. Look, I've sort of maintained, you know, I thought this was a nine and three team this year. Uh, I thought they would split the four kind of marquee games and then drop one they weren't supposed to. It's kind of heading roughly in that direction. I mean, we'll see where it kind of goes the second half of this season, but I have always maintained and will continue to maintain that it's the end of 2025 is really kind of the judgment year for Lincoln Riley, that next year, this team has to make the playoff. And if they cannot make the playoff next year, then I don't believe Lincoln Riley should be the coach in 2026. Now, will he be because of the financial element of only being 40 million into a hundred million dollar contract? And where is the appetite of the USC boosters to even sort of pay half of that buyout to kind of 30 million buyout and then pay, you know, top dollar or close to top dollar for a new coach that remains to be seen. But from a pure performance perspective, if Lincoln Riley does not make the playoff next year, there is no scenario on earth in a rational world where Lincoln Riley should be the coach after 2025. And the reason I say that coach and Rye is I did some research since 2000, Okay, there's been 14 coaches that have won the national title since 2000. There have been 16 instances of coach-team combinations that have won the national title since 2000. Because Saban won it in two different places, Bama and LSU. Urban won it in two different places in terms of Florida and Ohio State. So 16 instances of coach-team combination winning the national title since 2000, which we would kind of argue as sort of the modern era of college football. 12 of those 16 instances, the coach won the national title within four years. 12 out of the 16 instances. The only four instances where the coach didn't win the national title in four years was Kirby Smart, Mac Brown, Dabo Sweeney, Jim Harbaugh. And if we break that down further, Kirby Smart won the national title year six at Georgia, but everyone forgets. He was in the national title, in overtime of the national title game in year two. He was already a national title contender by year two. So that's a little bit of a misnomer that he's not part of that group. And then you look at Mac Brown, coach. We know that well, why he's the national champion. I mean, year eight of Texas. But he was, he had a top five team by year four. Dabo was year eight national champion at Clemson, played in the national title game year seven, but he had a top 10 team by year four. And you got to remember, look at what Clemson was for the 20 years before Dabo Swinney. There's no comparison between Clemson over that 20-year period and USC over that 20-year period. But even within year four, he got the top 10. And then you got Harbaugh, who won the national title in year nine. But to me, coach, and I know you don't kind of like this, but I think Harbaugh's tenure at Michigan has everything to do with sign stealing. I mean, you, you go six years of total mediocrity And then you have this unprecedented exponential rise of college football in three years where you're making the playoff every year, you win the national title. And then the year you leave, now they're not even going to be ranked this year. They don't even have a quarterback this year. They have no quarterback pipeline. How do you sort of explain that in a rational way? To me, the Harbaugh era at Michigan is more like the steroid era when you're talking about home runs in baseball. There's just sort of an asterisk there. 
So when you Barry take a Bond step 73? back coach, yeah, I mean, when you take a step <laughs> back coach, when you say 12 of the 16 coaches won the natty within four years and the other four, you know, either played for the national title within two years or had a top five, top 10 team within four years to say Lincoln Riley needs to make the playoff next year to save his job. I think we're cutting him some slack. These guys yes. won it all in year four. All I'm saying is he's got to make the playoff next year to save his job. So no question about it. Anyone that thinks that he is sort of ahead of schedule, I mean, I would ask you to sort of refer to the data here. He's got to make the playoff to save his job, no question about it. And, and that's where we are. So he's got to really use the second half of this season as all of the preparation in the world to be ready for 2025 because it's make it or break it in 2025 for Lincoln. I'm interested to see maybe at a, at a 10 year mark with this 12 team playoff, if there still is a 12 team playoff and there still is NCAA football, because I don't think in 10 years there will be, but I could be wrong. I'm interested to see if that's changed in any way. You know what I mean? Because I mean, you are making, you're making a crystal ball. It's turning it in three, right? Miami <laughs> crystal ball has been there three years. He's turning it in three. Uh, the question is, and there's always going to be the outstanding question. Who do you replace them with? But that's neither here nor there. Because I have some guys, but I don't think – the guy that I have in mind, I don't think is good enough. I don't think Matt Campbell is good enough to be an SC head coach. I could be wrong, but I just don't think he, he's good enough. But he's doing a good job where he is. But I, I, I will say this. Why can't they start fundraising the money now? Why can't they put it in a high-yield account? Why can't they let the interest grow on it? And then when it's time to go, it's already there. And then they could use what's ever left over for the next buyout. Like, why are you not starting that process now? And let's just say, let's just say Lincoln Riley finds a lucky penny walking into his office one day, right? Finds a lucky penny. All of a sudden, this thing flips. And then he becomes a winner. And then we're 10 years down the well, we're seven years down the line. It's time for extension. Why can't you just use that money for the extension because of all the interest that accrued on it? Like, I, I just I just think me as an athletic director and as a fundraiser, as a booster, need to prepare for these situations instead of being in a situation where you, you why not start doing it now? I'm pretty sure there's money people calling for his head already. Let's start working on the money now. And if we, if we don't need to use it, we have the money to extend it because seven years down the line, if you have the money for the buyout and you got a, the interest building on it, you have the money for his extension. But I'll only give his ass two years to extend him after 10 and we'll go from there. But, well, you got to give him four. You got to be fair. But I'm just saying, like, why not do that now? Why not start working on it now instead of being in a scramble when it's time to time to go? You get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Totally, coach. I mean, I'm, we've been hogging the tube. I'll let Ryan speak, and then yeah. we, can, we can keep going. Yeah, We're too negative for Ryan today. I can see it on his face like. <laughs> no, I, I don't think you'd need to fundraise, though. I mean, if enough boosters want him out, they'll just be like, we'll write the check. Like, I don't think uh, the AD has got to go fundraising for it. Uh, I'm pretty sure if usually when these fight, not always, but a lot of times when they happen, it's the boosters calling for it. So, they're like, make the call. We got the money. <laughs> we'll yeah. do it. Um, yeah, but I agree. I think it's – I think it's – he's got till 25. I mean, you know, it would set it them back – and I love Matt Campbell. He was actually coach before Riley, Luke Fickle, and Matt Campbell were like two of my top choices for SC after they fired Clay Hilton. But um, I mean, even with being three and three, when you when you see recruiting, they're about to flip two two more top guys, one from Utah, one from Florida State. I mean, you you set everything back again three years if you fire right now. I mean, you got to give them till twenty five, and then if if it if, like I I agree, it's it might not even, it might be national. Uh, natty appearance or bust, not even playoff. Um, but I mean, I think you got to go again, and t- unless they finish four and eight this year, that's different. But if they finish nine and three, then next year this is the year. But I mean, if you were no, to I, I think year, I think it's, it's totally like you, fair. You, you got to give him till the four years. You got to give him the full body of work. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And I think I think Ryan's spot on with setting the recruiting back. But we also then need to have an honest conversation, Coach, about the state of this program because. If you can't get it turned around in four years, you're either not an elite coach, you're not at an elite program, or both, right? And so that's really the the situation that we're in. And, you know, we have to – one of the interesting storylines as well is, and and we've talked about this, that I'm kind of looking out for uh, over the course of these six games is a lot of conversation about Lincoln, rightfully so. And the reason it's rightfully so on Lincoln is the mecca 
of college football will be here in the opening press conference. It's kind of the, the LeBron, not five, not six, not seven. When you put that target on your chest, you know, you need the big time results. And number two, he's getting paid 10 million a year. He's getting paid what Saban got paid. He's getting paid what Kirby got paid. He's getting paid what Urban would have gotten paid. I mean, so those are the results that you're expecting when you're getting paid that amount of money. If he was making 5 million bucks a year, uh, the, the expectation would be different. But then you're sort of at a different program, right? So the, the, the salary, the, the bravado, all is sort of pointing in this particular direction. And so rightfully so, the attention is on Lincoln. But I'm also very interested and curious to see how both Danton Lynn and Eric Henderson kind of finish out this season. Because I think no one is questioning Henderson's ability to recruit. I mean, it's been phenomenal. But, you know, it's a little bit different when you don't have Aaron Donald, right? I mean, it's a little bit different when you don't have one of the three to five greatest defensive players or overall players in the history of football you know, on your defensive line. So how are you managing that now moving forward? You know, you're propping him up to get these recruits. You're saying, hey, I look, I, I, this is the greatest version of yourself you can possibly be in Aaron Donald, so come here. It's an easy recruiting cell, but the, the shelf life of that recruiting cell doesn't last forever. You're going to have to sort of produce something on your own as well. Otherwise, you can't just keep propping up Aaron Donald after a year or two years because everyone's going to say, well, was it you or was it Aaron Donald or what, what's really going on there in terms of, you know, your impact on, on the Rams and your impact on, on sort of his career moving forward. And the second thing, Coach, I'll say is about Danton. I mean, I think there's a little bit of question, you know, how much was Latu, <laughs> you know, the ace in the hole last year at UCLA? I mean, we saw... This is a top 15 pick. We saw him sack Caleb in the NFL. This guy's going to be a bona fide all pro in the NFL for, for years to come. Knock on wood, if he doesn't get injured, you know, when you've got a, an ace in the hole like that, where you can sort of rush the passer from any direction, from any geography on the field, any down, any circumstance, then that allows you, as we've talked about, to disguise that zone shell, create plus one scenarios because you know you have a one man pass rush. So what does Danton Lynn look like without Leatu Latu? What does Eric Henderson look like without Aaron Donald? And I think we've got a nice six-game body of work to kind of see them evolve as well going into this make it or break at 25. You got anything on that, Ryan? No, I, I totally agree. I think that on a, again, just devil, whatever you want to call it, devil's advocate or positive side, because I think that's 100% spot on. I think if you look at a good thing from it is, look at a guy like Devin Tompkins because, you know, the best player on the defensive line, if we want to just be harsh, quit on the team, Bear Alexander, right? He was their best player that they inherited. The other were two three-star transfers in Gavin Meyer and um, all of a sudden drawn a blank guy from Vandy that uh, has Clifton. been playing great. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And then, and then it's a bunch of freshmen. And then Devin Tompkins, I think has really, you can see the actual progression that he has made from spring fall to now, getting a lot more reps in these games and it's becoming an actual focal point of that defensive line. Where will Jade Abisari be at the end of the season? Where will Carlin Jones be when he's healthy? This 25 class they're bringing in that is getting more defensive linemen and potentially flipping. So I totally agree with you, but I also think because Danton's been there since December 1st, Henderson's been there since end of January when the Rams off the playoffs, like it needs to be at two years. Like what is, what have they improved? You can't look at a, a spring ball and a fall practice in six games and saying, all right, look at these transfers. They haven't improved like we thought they would. So that's the only thing I'll add to that. Cause I, but I agree that's, that's going to have to be what they mote their salt on and not just bringing a, an NFL player to the sidelines. That's what I was going to ask you guys. I was going to ask you, do you think there's pressure now that Miami is a contender again? Cause they've been kind of in the same situation as he has been these past, what, 20 years. Like people didn't my, the Miami that we knew growing up, like, Kids don't know how good Miami used to be, and they don't know about the U. You know what I mean? Now Miami's a national contender. Do you think there's any pressure from, like, the Miamis of the world and all the teams that are coming back? The the NIL is supposed to make it fair for everybody, right? The SEC is not the only ones doing it anymore. Everybody's doing it. So, like, you can't control it. Like, now you have Miami, who's legit probably a playoff team. Like, do you think there's any pressure on Lincoln Riley? Because, like, hey, these programs can turn. Why are you not turning it? Coach, I think it's it's data. You know, it, it helps the argument of urgency. But I would argue the pressure to win at USC comes from within USC. It, yeah. it just needs to be within the USC walls. 
and why 2025 is such a significant year, Coach. Hard to believe this. I, you know, and every time I say it, I, it, I get depressed. But you know, it's a 20 year anniversary of Leinart and Bush next year. I mean, that was the 05 season. You know, that was sort of that culminated in the January 4, 2006 Rose Bowl. We're going into the 25 season. It's been 20 years since the iconic 03 to 05 run. 17 years since we would say the end of the glory years of the Pete Carroll era of 2008. You know, that was the last great USC team. What is significant about 17 years is what's the age of an incoming, you know, freshman is going to be about 17, 18. It means they weren't born the last time USC was truly great. You know, the, the idea of sort of USC football, what's the greatest game USC football has had the last 17 years? It was the Rose Bowl against Penn State with Darnold. Like, that's the yeah. barometer of, of what USC football has been over the last 17 years. And so the pressure to win is to be able to create those memories and that success in this generation. Because if you kind of let go of the rope for 15 or 20 years, it is really hard in this sport, as we've seen, to get it back. Because it takes even more investment, it takes even more resources, it takes even more time, it takes even more strategy to be successful. So, you know, you could look at a Miami, you can look at a Texas, you know, I mean, Sark had true, it, you know, true, was in the playoff uh, year three. You can look at Oregon with Lanning. You can look at a lot of different programs and say, hey, they, they got it going here in, in three or four years. Why can't you do the same? So I think it's just part of the narrative of the pressure but I think the, the, the motivation has to come from within. And I think to sort of double click on Ryan's point, that's why 25 is so meaningful. We need to see this jump. We need to be able to see this jump in performance. And Ryan, I'm totally with you. You know, how does Abasari play? How does Jones play? How does Fountain play? You know, mm-hmm. how does Tompkins play? Lucas comes back now, hopefully, uh, you know, for one more year. How does this revised defensive line play? Look, the benefit of getting kind of gentry back next year. We, it was a really young linebacking crew when you lose Cobb, Mascarenas, Arnold, and potentially gentry. Now you've got an anchor in gentry. Hopefully he's a leader of that young group. You know, how do all these guys gel with more of your guys second year in strength and conditioning? So totally get it. It's been sort of a patchwork roster, but you got to be able to see the jump next year uh, to playoff caliber. I think to, to ho- have Lincoln be accountable to a top 12 finish by year four, I think is more than reasonable. And if he cannot get it done, regardless of what the roster is, regardless of what is going to come in 26 and 27, look, you're, you're just not the guy if you can't take this team to the playoff within four years. I think if you rewound the clock back two years, back to his introductory press conference, based on what he said, based on who he was at Oklahoma, and you said Lincoln Riley will, have, will not yet achieve a playoff through year three, I think everybody would sit there and be very disappointed. And so I think we just have to hold him accountable to that initial standard. And he's got one more crack at it now in 25. So I still say we just start raising the money now and let the interest hit it just in case. I think that's an excellent idea. I think I should be an AD. I think that's an excellent idea. I mean, I'm just saying that's an excellent idea. And then just honestly, though, just think about it. If So next year he makes the playoff, right? And let's say he goes on the run. Year 10 comes up. And it's like, it's time to extend them. We don't have to look for the money. It's right here. We'll just take the money out. Boom. This and that. But I'm just hoping somebody comes and takes him and just buys his contract out. And we, I think we just, I, I don't know. I'll stay patient with you guys. How about I do that? I'll, I'm not saying we need to fire him now. It doesn't make no sense to fire him now. L- Lincoln's going to land on his feet, you know, regardless of sort of what happens here. Yeah. I think. Like Cliff. I mean, like Cliff. Exactly. You, you see what Cliff is doing with the commanders yeah. with Jaden Daniels. I mean, Lincoln coming in and being a top offensive coordinator for the Bears or a top offensive coordinator for, you know, a, a team with a real quarterback on the rise. I think I think he'll do outstandingly well, um, you know, Lincoln being offensive coordinator, of the Cowboys. I mean, there's all kinds of different scenarios out there, but, you know, we're getting ahead of ourselves. He's going to be just fine. I think the big question is Lincoln Riley, the head coach. What what does that look like? You know, how much of this was. Bob Stoops kind of setting him up for success in those three playoff appearances and how much of it is is his overall holistic greatness. We know about the quarterback whisper. And here's the last part I'll say, and I won't pile on. You know, the shelf life in the NFL is so short where Lincoln Riley also has this sort of window of opportunity where he is the unquestioned quarterback whisper. Because couldn't you guys see a scenario, and Ryan and, and Coach, you're, you're much more NFL guys than I am, but couldn't you see a scenario in 2026 where Kyler Murray's not a starting quarterback, 
where Baker Mayfield is not a starting quarterback, where Jalen Hurts is not a starting quarterback. Like the cycles in the NFL go so quickly where, you know, obviously the stat we all love to say four starting quarterbacks, potentially five now with Rattler. You know, that number goes down to like one or two in two years. Just just the nature of this, you know, the, the need to win now in the NFL. So even Riley, in terms of his cachet, his influence on the game, there is a window here. It's sort of this year, next year, year after. That's his window. Really, unless these guys, one of these guys kind of blows up and kind of sustains, um, that's his window of opportunity. So it's really all roads point to 2025 where he's got to be able to perform um, to be able to have more of on the resume to then be able to kind of have that long-term success. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is like, I, I when I say we need to get rid of him, you're right. I, I'm making it seem like we just need to call him in now and get rid of him. I'm not saying that. I'm pretty much saying like we need to, start preparing to make a move we need to be prepared to make a move when that move happens i don't know but we need to be in the right situation to make that move because i don't see the change like you're not gonna you can't convince me that next year is going to be different you can't there's nothing you could do to convince me that next year is going to be different there's absolutely nothing you can say that all of a sudden everything is going to change i just don't see it i don't see it it's too much I don't want to be forever, but there's too much. We're one play away. We're one play away. We're one play away. You're never going to have your team psychologically ready ever to win a championship because if you lose a championship, you're going to say, oh, we were one player away from winning the championship. You always have an excuse and you always have an out. That's not what you do. You have to just be honest. Like, we did not play well. This is where we need to get better. We lost this game. We got to go get better off of this. But it's always one play away. You're finding the out and finding the excuse and you can't get better mentally and you'll never get better physically doing it that way we've been here too long you guys got anything before we get out of here no all good all right we went down <laughs> we went down that road man man I, it, it strung away but it, it we you said we was going to end up getting there and we end up getting there in the pre-show so hey i appreciate you guys if you guys want to go look at some interesting articles like ryan and madman both have good articles up go to lafb network and go check out the articles if you guys want to know about the rams go to lafb network if you guys want to know about the chargers and the other team across town we're all there in one place. You guys are in a fantasy. Go check out my man, Armor Desai and Ty Desai, my Indian brothers from another mother. You my Indian brother from another mother too, man, man. Don't worry about it. I didn't forget you. But go check those guys out. They're getting into the fantasy stuff too. Don't forget to go to betonline.ag where all the game starts. And check out Underdog Fantasy, underdogfantasy.com. Put in promo code USCLAFB and get up to a $100 match. I appreciate you guys. It's been a very good conversation. Ryan, we'll get positive, I think. But I don't think we're going to be very. Don't have to. Do whatever you want. <laughs> I know you. I, I sometimes look on your face. It's like, man, these guys are. <laughs> I know how you get about it sometimes, but I appreciate you. Yeah, no, you can do whatever you want. I appreciate you too, man, man. I appreciate you both, guys. I appreciate all you fans. Thank you guys for tuning in. You guys know how it is. It's been a launch to the Detroit podcast. Live free. Fight on. <laughs>